Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Brandon Van Asten, who is the owner and operator of Canadian Cold Blood. Brandon is the most prolific tree monitor breeder on the planet. He's been breeding tree monitors for 12 years now. He currently works with all six species. In general, he has a ton of reptile breeding experience. He's been breeding reptiles since the 90s, many different reptiles or geckos and monitor species, but he has been focusing on tree monitors for the past 12 years. In the episode, we discuss how he got into tree monitor breeding and how he noticed some issues or mistakes people were making early on with tree monitor breeding that were giving hatchability issues. And he corrected those mistakes quite quickly and this is what allowed him to have you know the, the the foundation for the success he's had since then we discussed the different species he keeps their difference in behavior color obviously how he cares for them how he breeds them the ethics of breeding such a advanced species and how to make sure that those animals are actually going to the right home Brandon is an incredible wealth of information. I, I encouraged him at the end of the episode that he should get into writing a book because I think it would be very easy for him to do because he is somebody who keeps such diligent notes. So if you're somebody that wants to work with tree monitor species or is attempting to breed them, this is an episode that will be for you. Even if you're someone that never, like me, probably will never keep a tree monitor just because I know it's not going to fit with my lifestyle, this is an incredibly fascinating episode and you'll be able to pull out so much information that will translate to other species as well. Let's not get into any more detail. Let's just let Brandon speak for himself. Enjoy the episode. Awesome. Well, Brandon, welcome kind of back to the podcast. We did a semi-podcast back a few months ago live at the CRBE, but this is a first real episode. So, so welcome back to the show and thank you for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Really Thank looking you, forward to it. I mean, I, I you're a very well known name, especially now in, in the tree monitor space. Everybody knows uh, Canadian Cold Blood, so it's it, it'll be really interesting to kind of hear some of the backstory and also you know, what you what you're working on right now. I I feel like when we chatted in September, it, you, maybe you implied or maybe that was the sense I got that you got into monitor breeding fairly early on in your reptile keeping career. I know you've been breeding monitors for a long time. Did you start breeding monitors relatively soon uh, from your keeping time or have you been keeping for a long time before that? No, you know what? I think like my first, well, my first reptile was, I, I couldn't even tell you what species it was. It was some fence lizard that you bought at a pet store probably when I was my parents got it for me when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old right and uh, I mean that thing always fascinated me but you know it was well before any knowledge I had of keeping and stuff and and then uh, um, I progressed from that and I was really really interested back in probably the mid 90s like maybe 94, 95 in chameleons for some, I loved chameleons, just everything about them. And then that's when sort of veiled chameleons became available. And, uh, yeah, I saved and saved and saved for my first pair of <laughs> veiled chameleons. And that was my first real foray into like, okay, I did the research. Uh, you know, I set up these nice setups and the, with the goal of trying to propagate them, right? I, I think I had an old issue of a very magazine that I read and then there was a chameleon, a book about chameleons that I kind of got some information and I, you know, I really, that was my first foray into like really trying to do well with the, with the animals as a, you know, as a 15 year old kid and, and, uh, you know, that, that worked out with veiled chameleons, it, you know, they're not difficult to breed, but at the time it was kind of like a holy grail for me. And, um, yeah, I was able to breed them and then, um, and then, uh, you know, I remember the first, the first clutch of eggs I got, I was like 52 eggs or something and they, <laughs> all, they all hatched, right? It was crazy. And, uh, that was back in the day where I was like, oh man, these things are expensive to feed. And I'm, you know, 16 or 15 maybe. And I'm like, man, I have to, uh, I have to, um, sorry, I got to shut my phone. I have to, uh, feed these things. Right. So I was like, you know, they're eating thousands of crickets a week, all these babies. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, now I have to try and sell them, right? Like I have to get rid of them. And that was before the internet really was commonly available. That was before Kijiji and all that stuff. So I literally had to go to the phone book and call up pet stores and be like, Hey, would you be interested in some veiled chameleons like this? And <laughs> it feels over the phone. And then I get my mom to drive me to like a PDA, you know, and a uh, big owls and sell them. Right. And, and that's how, that's how I did it. But you know, and then I was like, oh, this is a little bit of a business now too, right? So, and then from there, the next thing that really caught my attention, it always fell on the back of like Reptiles Magazine, right? Uh, because whatever was the the, the feature article was usually something pretty cool back in the day. And then it was frilled lizards and and man, oh, I, frilled lizards were that thing. And 
and uh, I had to get a few frilled lizards and it kind of just worked out from there. I had frilled lizards and a few geckos and then probably about, I would say it was probably about five years into kind of the chameleons and frilled lizards. That's when the Ackies came on the scene in like the late nineties. And, uh, yeah, I was fascinated by the Ackies and monitors. And then I got, I was able to get my first pair of Ackies. I think Port Credit Pet Center brought them in like 1998 or 99 or something. And I was able to get a couple of those animals. And then the rest is history. I've wow. never not read Ackies since that point. <laughs> right? That is wild. Had them, yeah. So, so you kind of hit the ground running with breeding. I mean, it's it's funny thinking you as as a 15 or 16 year old, you, it's almost like you just want to try to see if you're capable of doing it, but you don't actually think about the result of having to deal with 52 babies suddenly. And that, yeah, that, was, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't the goal, right? It wasn't the goal of like selling babies. It was just like, you know, I, I think that's the goal of anybody who's trying to do right by it, like the reptile that they have, if you know, they, they, I think for, for my intents and purposes, the standard of like quality of care would be reproduction and captivity, right? If your animals are happy and healthy and all that stuff, then they can reproduce. Never kind of thought about the back end of it. Like, Oh, what am I going to do when I have all these babies and that sort of thing? Right. So that's what you have to deal with afterwards. But, but yeah, just to, I mean, just to you know, imagine never having seen that before. And, you know, chameleons, first off, they're really rare. It's not like, at that time, they were really rare, and you know, to see little babies coming out of the egg. I mean, holy smokes, that was an intense. You know, that was like the best thing that ever happened to me at that point. It's like holy cow, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah and then it, then once you get that bug, you're you're kind of hooked, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and I kind of imagine the the were the frilled lizards quite quite an investment at that time because I mean they're they're pretty expensive. I don't know what they were like back then, or you're getting wild caught in, or, or how did that work? Yeah, they were. Um, the yeah at that time like i had sold a a bunch of the baby veiled chameleons and i had given some to uh port credit pet center and uh that's a place out here near toronto and uh you know i got i got a one wild caught juvenile frilled dragon from them and then i ordered another one from a from a company in the u.s and uh um actually i ordered two of them from that company in the u.s so i had three animals and And then part of the problem for me was, you know, I was late high school at at this point and now I'm going to university. What the heck do I do with these things? Right. So my, my parents were nice enough. My dad was nice enough because first year I lived in residence. My dad's like, I'll take care of them for the year. And, you know, we, we all know what that's like. If you have somebody looking after your stuff, that's not too into it. They just kind of do the maintenance stuff and nothing died, but they never reproduced or anything. And then, you know, and then after I finished my first year university, uh, And then I was able to get the frilled lizards into the house that we rented the second year. And then, then I was able to breed them and do that sort of thing. So, yeah, but back in that time, they were, I'm trying to think they were fairly expensive. I I know I was selling, I think the veiled chameleons at the time were like a hundred dollars a piece. I was selling them for, and you know, I know I had to give up quite a few veiled chameleons to get the frilled lizards. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. 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 So let, let's bring us up to speed today. Now you have quite an operation at your place and things have obviously changed. As you said, you, you, you got, eventually got into breeding Ackies and ever since that day, you're still continuously producing them and, and you, you know, you're working with uh, many species now. So maybe you could list off just some of the species. We'll get into some more detail about them later. And then also, can you just tell us, for those who, who haven't seen your place, Dion did a great video doing a, a tour of your place on Reptiliatus. But for those that haven't seen, maybe describe the, the setup that you have for, for your animals. Yeah, so right now, um, well, for the last 10 years or so now, I bought a farm and uh, it's actually a, it's actually zoned as farmland. So I actually uh, registered it as a farm for breeding reptiles. And then I had, I built a a facility uh, and totaled about 3000 square feet. Uh, it's a two-story facility built into the side of a side of a hill. So I have an upstairs and a downstairs and and uh yeah and that's where i do all breeding operations in there and uh um you know from the bugs i feed them to everything right to some road like you you name it everything's kind of all contained in this building separate from the house which my wife is happy yeah yeah. (laughs) uh, yeah so and then just the the whole you know the whole shop is just is just uh enclosures that i've built every single one of them i've built every 
you know, custom enclosure for all the monitors has been built by me. And, uh, yeah, just kind of laid out in rows in there and kind of optimized it over the years, I guess. Yeah. And, and what's the quantity of animals? Do you have a kind of a, num- a rough number? Ooh. Um, man, it's a tough question. Uh, I, I mean, of, of breeding animals, um, breeding animals, I probably like between monitors and geckos, you know, I probably have maybe 40 to 50 pairs of different breeding monitors and, you know, maybe the same with the geckos, 40 to 50 pairs or so, you yeah. know, I kind of, I, you know, I could go probably bigger, but I like to do it predominantly myself. I mean, I do have a girl that helps me, but I find that if you get too big and you have too many tentacles and too many areas that things suffer. So I kind of optimize with what I have and, and, uh, yeah. And also, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work. So the more you have, the more work it is. But Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, it looks like a tremendous amount of work. I mean, when you look at the place you have, I, it wouldn't be shocking if somebody thought that was your full-time job. And obviously that isn't your full-time job for people that don't know you're a school teacher. We talked about that when you had, when we had you on, uh, on the live show. So you actually have a full-time job. So all I can imagine is that you have two full-time jobs. Yeah. Well, I have, yeah, I have the reptile thing. That's why I have, uh, my, uh, my employee Jocelyn. She's great. Um, she does a lot of the routine things that saves hours of my day in there. And it lets me focus on more of the breeding aspect and, you know, the feedings and stuff. Cause that's where I interact with them. Um, and she handles more of the mundane cleaning and watering and doing all that stuff. So that's been a godsend. And, um, yeah, like I'm a high school teacher and, uh, I have, a, you know, a like a cottage rental business that I run too. So I have a bunch of rental properties I gotta manage and and then two kids, two two kids, one teenager and one that's just about to become a teenager. So and all their stuff. So yeah, I I I, I don't know if I could go any bigger at this point, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it's probably good that you have a limit. I mean it sounds like yeah. uh, you, you must be cutting back on the sleep or something. I don't know how you do it all. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? It's like over the years you learn to like, I've, you know, you go through these phases where when you're young and, amb- and ambitious, like, Oh man, I, that's so cool. I want that. And I want that. And I want that. And I want that. And then you end up looking around and like, I have so many different things from so many different genera. How the heck can I possibly look after them all properly? Right. Cause they're all so different. Right. So mm-hmm. that's when I kind of really focused on, you know, the the monitor lizards, that, that's what I really liked. And I was like, you know what, as a genus, they're similar, the housing and everything's similar. So I can do them all in the same shop, in the same scope with almost the same parameters, right? And uh, yeah, and then, you know, I've had lots of different monitor species. I've had every single Odatria that's been available even some that you wouldn't find available now. And uh, I've even narrowed those down to the ones that I just personally really like and mm. and have that kind of wow factor. And um, yeah, so I've even cut down the number of species that I work with to focus on the ones that uh, that really, you know, I find that people like in general and then I do obviously as well. So yeah, it's, yeah. obviously it's important to stay connected with things that you're passionate about. It makes it a lot easier to do the work. Do, do, do you picture, do you, do you plan like 10, 15 years down the road with, with that business or, or do you just kind of take it one year at a time and as long as you're still enjoying it, you still produce or do you think like, okay, maybe in 20 or 15 years, whenever you would retire ten, from teaching, you want to do that full time? Like, do, do, do you uh, plan that far? Well, yeah, you know what? It's like, it's like one of those things like, uh, I, I say this to my wife all the time. It's like, I can't, I can't picture a day going forward in my life where I'll ever get out of reptiles, right? This mm-hmm. is something that's not work for me, right? It's it's work in the aspect that I have to put in some time, but I enjoy it, right? I think that's what's going to keep me going into the future is like, you know, a new exciting project or doing this and doing that. Like, you know, I can't ever see myself uh, getting out of them. Now in the future, I do, when we retire, you want to travel and do this and that. So I might need some more help and put some more trust in people's hands, but but yeah, I can't, you know, I've set myself up like with the tree monitors specifically, I, you know, did a little bit of math and I figured out, okay, if I want to breed these things until let's say I, I can actually physically breed them until I'm 80 years old, I'm 44 now. Right. So in a monitor's lifespan, like a tree monitor's lifespan is 
or breeding span at the minimum might be 10 years, right? So, you know, I have 40 years of, of uh, or four generations from now until maybe the day I, I actually stop doing it at 80 or something. So I figure I need about four unique, distinct bloodlines or pairs of each species that I have. And then I can breed them from now until the day I probably will stop in, you know, my 80s or something. And then I don't have to inbreed. So I, I do, I have planned that out into the future. So I planned it out even, you know, let's say Indonesia stopped export and I couldn't get any new bloodline. Now I have all set distinct bloodlines for the species that I'm working with. So I'm pretty much self-contained now mm -hmm. in, in that respect. So I have planned it out with the, with the hope that I will do this from now until, you know, God willing, until I can, right? I mean, or unless laws change or something changes where I'm unable to do it anymore. But yeah, that's the, that's the hope. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, you you do come across as somebody who is a planner and thinks about things, like, you know, as diligently as possible. You know, I know, and you had mentioned before last time we chatted the amount of notes that you're taking all the time. So I can imagine that you're you're thinking down the road to to make sure that the project is going to make sense. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it, it ha you know what? That's exactly it was with the you know the four distinct bloodlines of tree monitors and stuff. Like I did the math, you know, a female might have a 10 year breeding life. And, you know, if I have to cross the lines that I have, how can I, you know, pyramid out until I get, you know, to the end destination of when maybe I don't do it anymore. Right. So that, that was all part of it. Part of it is too, like, I, I do suspect at some point in the future that, uh, export of wild collected animals won't be happening anymore, especially mm -hmm. tree monitors are always on the radar in terms of like, protection globally and stuff which is good i mean i have no qualms about that so um but but yeah so i i've kind of anticipated these things with these trends and stuff like that you know yeah planning so that i can at least stay self self-contained you know <laughs> well I, so. I think that's a good practice for breeders of almost any species to, to just imagine that let's say just imagine fictionally 10 years down the road whatever animal you're working with you're not going to be able to get new genetics in every operation should attempt to set themselves up in a way that can be self-contained without having to default to massive inbreeding in order to continue to produce be because we see it all the time in our trade that people inbreed like insane, especially when you bring in the morphs and whatnot, then it kind of gets exasperated in that sense. But even without that, people are so eager to breed that they just rather just inbreed to get a clutch or a litter rather than actually think taking the time to think, what if down the road you actually can't get new genetics in and now you have completely bottlenecked everything you have? Yeah, and that's, you know what, the reality is a lot of the species, depending on where they come from, have been bottlenecked in that way, right? If you think about Ackies, bearded dragons for that mm -hmm. fact, right? I mean, anything that originally came from Australia, there's only a handful of specimens that the original keepers got anyway. So genetically, there is no diversity there, right? So when people ask me about, oh, do you have a different bloodline of Kimberly Rock Monitor? It's like, well... I have tried to keep as about about as distantly related animals as I possibly could, right? But the reality is, is that probably all came from the same source initially, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm sure if you got them genetically tested, you'd see that, right? The guys in Europe are selling their Kimberly Rock monitors, which are the same lineage as mine. In fact, I've sold hundreds of them to Europe, right? So, yes. yeah. Uh, they they all have their same or I mean it, it, I mean unless there's illegally acquired animals recently right due to smuggling or something they're all going to be related right and unless it's a species that allows export right of wild collected individuals you're going to get that bottleneck of genetics so that's why with the tree monitors I see what what goes on with like Australian animals because Australia doesn't let export anymore after like I think it was 1974 they shut it down um so with the tree monitors that's why I was kind of really on a game plan to get distinct bloodlines so that you know in the future if they did shut down export like Australia did that I could say to customers with full confidence yes I have different bloodlines for you yeah. and when people tell me that for the Australian animals I, I I don't lie to them. I said, you know, the likelihood is that no, they're they're going to be somewhat related in some way, right? Now, the flip side of that is, okay, what does that mean? Like, what does inbreeding mean to a reptile? I mean, we've done it for, in dogs and cats for thousands of generations, and yeah, it's, it's it's. I mean, it has some adverse effects in certain certain breeds of dogs, but 
it, overall, it hasn't led to the mutants that people in society think that it does, right? So, so you know, but obviously, inbreeding is not ideal. Outcrossing is the best. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit about how you got into the tree monitors? Because that is a very, you know, they're, they're an incredibly interesting group of animals. I think they're the most eye-catching. People love to see the different colors and whatnot. So how did you first stumble across them? And then what made you take the plunge into, well, I, I can, I think we could probably all imagine why you take the plunge to try to breed them because it's just the, the type of person you are. But, but when did you come across them first? Um, I think it had to be, I think I got my first blues 12 years ago um and it's not that i didn't have the opportunity to get them before so all you know all through the you know late 90s and early 2000s uh, you know up until 20 you know 12 or 24 whenever it was i got the blues i was just odatria and part of my philosophy was i don't want to compete with anything that comes in in droves wild caught right mm -hmm. if i'm going to the effort to breed them and spend the money in feeding them and housing them and doing all that stuff it's very it's a very tough pill to swallow when you're competing you know you want to sell them for a certain price to recoup you know the money you've invested into them and you are competing with somebody that just imported a whole bunch of sickly animals from indonesia because in my experience you know if if a customer has to pay $500 more, like if you're talking tree monitors that are thousands of dollars each, right? You know, if somebody had to pay $2,500 from a pet store that imported one, or let's say $3,000 for a captive bred blue tree from me, you know, unfortunately, people always, you know, a lot of them will make that decision and go with the $500 cheaper one, but then they'll suffer the consequences, right? Uh, of sickly animals, you know, a lot of times they die, all that sort of stuff. Right. So, um, so that was the reason I didn't do, I didn't do it. And the, the blue trees kind of, um, fell into my lap. I had, uh, I, I, I knew a person that had a pair of them and, uh, and, uh, you know, they were keep like they had two McCray in like a big exoter, like a 36 by 36 oh, by wow. Yeah, Exoterra, and uh, they they basically asked me if I I wanted to try breeding them. They had two two males and a female, and they're like, "Do you think you could breed these things?" And I was confident that I could, but I just never wanted to get into them just for that reason that they did come in wild caught. But I was like, "Eh, this person offered me these ones. I'll you know as a breeding loan, I'll, I'll try it." Right. So I, I set up one of the pairs, and I had the lone male off to the side. I set up the pair and. Uh, I was able to get them to breed and I was, the, I was able to get eggs from the female, but the female, I don't know how old she was and she lay a couple eggs and they were infertile and I was like, okay, so I'm getting the cycle ready and, and I'm getting, I'm getting certain things dialed in, but I don't know about how old this, this female is. Right. And then coincidentally, I was at a CRB expo and, uh, uh, I, I had a bunch of my monitors there and just some some guy randomly walks up to me and he says how come you don't uh you don't breed uh tree monitors and i was like well I, i'm working with some i have a couple blues at home seeing what i can do with them and he says oh he's like i work at a pj's pet center in pickering right it's just just in ontario here and uh he's like i work at a pj's pet center pickering and we've had this blue tree in the store for like Three years, we got it as a baby, and we raced it up the store. And he's like, nobody, nobody wants to buy it. I, the price is too high on it. And I was like, really? And I'm me in the back of my mind thinking, what are the chances it's actually a female, right? Like, what are the chances of female? It's probably male or something. So I was like, do you know anybody at the store that could shoot you some pictures of it right now while you're here at the show? Because I don't, I didn't live too far from the PJs that he was talking about, like a 15, 20 minute drive. I just did never went in there at this point in my life, right? So I never saw it. I never went into the PJs. So so he gets some pictures sent to him. He comes back to my table like a half hour. Like, yeah, he took some pictures. I look at this thing. I'm like, oh man, I think that's female, right? So <laughs> oh, sure enough, the the expo ended on the Sunday. I drove to the PJs on the Monday, and uh, I looked it over, and I was like, yeah, that's a female, and it's you know it's in pretty good shape for a pet store animal, and and. Uh, they, but they had a ridiculous price tag on it, right? It was probably like, at the time, you know, I think imported blue trees were coming in. You could buy them for like $900 or something. And and they were asking like 3500 bucks for this 
this import thing. So I said, I just made him a deal. I said, hey, why don't I give you a whole bunch of animals that you can actually sell? like some geckos and ball pythons and I'll trade you for this blue tree. So it worked out. And so I got this thing and, and uh, yeah, the rest is history, man. That female was good. I think within three months, she laid me a clutch of uh, five eggs. And then ever since that time, I've been getting five eggs every three months from that girl. And that was, you know, 12 years ago that started. Wow. And then, yeah. And then, um, so, so, and to be quite honest, I, I found them, easier to breed than like the Kimberly rock monitors uh, in terms of like hatching the eggs and, and stuff like that. So, um, and so, and I had had, you know, I had seen people in the past try and breed blues and kill babies and eggs. And, and uh, you know, I had tried to get a pair from a guy that was getting eggs, but he couldn't hatch them and he never coughed them up, but I was confident. I was like, I know what I'm doing with the Kims and people experience the same problems that they have with Kimberly eggs as they do with these tree monitor eggs. And I have, I had the Kimberly's dialed in at that point. So I was like, I'm confident I could do the blues. And, and yeah, the first clutch five eggs hatched them all. And the rest is history. They were, they were great. And then from there, I was like, okay, now let's try greens. I have had success with the blues. Let's try greens. Let's try the different colors. And then, you know, coincidentally in that trajectory of me really kind of starting to focus on tree monitors, the availability of them from Indonesia started to buckle down and the numbers of imports start to really diminish, which as a breeder, that's great for me, right? Um, unless I wanted to acquire more animals, that became a challenge trying to find some new bloodlines. But in terms of, you know, the demand for my offspring that shot it up, right? Mm -hmm. So to where we are today, and, you know, if you see an imported tree monitor come into Canada, you're pretty damn lucky, right? Like you never see them come in anymore. Um, so, you know, twofold, it's good for the, it's, you know, it's, it's good for the wild populations and from a breeder's perspective now i have the collection that i want it's good that i don't have to compete with those as much so yeah well yeah. and it's tough to motivate breeders to want to breed if there are giant droves of, of wild caught coming in like you said you know it, it's yeah. it's an issue on both sides the buyer is going to yeah. gravitate towards the cheaper animal and the breeder is not going to want to take the time to actually tinker with the species to figure it out so, so what was the issue with with the eggs i i know you had told me before but now i'm forgetting uh, people were getting good eggs but they weren't hatching or the animals were dying in the in the shell and so what 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 was it that you learned from the the kims that worked so well with the monitors or with with the blues yeah it's just um people have this this notion that you know you got to mix a one to one ratio of water to perlite and and do all this and and uh i mean basically it just led to the point where people were just drowning the embryos in the egg because the eggs were just too overhydrated right and uh what I'm, I'm not sure how that leads to the baby not being able to hatch whether it's just the pressure inside the egg and you'd hear of people you know they they open their incubator and then they open the egg box and the the pressure inside the egg is so great that the egg actually bursts open right wow. that was a thing too so you know i i lost a kimberly clutch or two in the infancy of figuring that out. But, you know, then you just, I just realized I had to dial back the water. I always erred on the side of being drier than wetter because it's easier to add water to the mixture than it is to try and take it away. Right. So, and that's what I would do. And I went through stage where I'd have my incubation container with the eggs and you kind of see what uh, an over hydrated or inflated egg looks like and then like okay i need to dry this out a bit so you know you poke some extra holes in and then if it started to dimple i would actually take those eggs out and put them in a slightly wetter medium in a different container let them fill back out then move them back like i was always playing with these things until i kind of got it dialed in and now i'm at a point where i you know i can roughly eyeball the water that goes in. Like I still measure out grams wise, what goes in to my mixture. And, and, uh, and then it's, it's pretty good. Now I don't have to tinker too much with the eggs. The only variable is the number of eggs you have in the incubator, right? Cause mm -hmm. the more egg boxes and medium you have in there, the more relative humidity goes up. So, you know, if you have a lot of eggs in there, you're barely putting any water in the substrate, right? Whereas if you have one clutch in the incubator, you better make it a bit wetter. So there's those variables, right? That's why when people ask me about egg incubation, I can't give you a particular recipe for your situation specifically, right? And that's why I always tell people, you know, you got to look at the eggs. If they look like a swollen ping pong ball, that's not good. They should be nicely, you know, 
elliptical in shape, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I, that's one of the, the there's the, what to me what you're describing is kind of like the art of doing what you're doing, and quite often I think people get stuck on the science side, which means you know they're just trying to follow exactly what somebody told them to do, whether it's on a forum or on, on Facebook, and they're trying to follow these exact exact steps, and then they're actually ignoring the visual evidence they have in front of them in order to make the right call. But so instead of just trying to follow common sense and learning how to do things by feel, they're just getting stuck on the instruction manual that they were given, and you know it all pretty much always ends up in disaster because you're not learning the the process of of, of making a successful hatch. Yeah, all, all the care sheets and stuff. I mean, it's great that people put them out there and it's just a general foundation of knowledge, but everybody's situation is different. Like my incubator here in Ontario in July when it's humid, I'm going to have to monitor those eggs and do things differently than if I lived in Calgary in January where it's bone dry, right? Mm -hmm. Um so there's all there's you know a lot of factors and that's why the best thing to do and, and I can say this because I've seen lots of eggs, but it's hard for somebody who hasn't. And I get that, um, you know, you have to look at the eggs and see what the egg actually looks like. Um, that's one of the things I, 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 when I get my new website up and running here, um, I, I'll, I'll show pictures like overhydrated egg, perfect egg. You know what I mean? Right. Yes, like you yeah. want that egg to have a nice shape, but to not have any dimples in it. But you don't want it like, like if it looks like a ping pong ball and it's all round, that's way too wet, right? <laughs> yeah. It needs to be that like elliptical shape. So I, I plan to do like a, you know, good egg check mark. This is bad. This is bad, right? So, but yeah, you just have to play with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you are interested in supporting the podcast and simultaneously supporting the welfare of your reptile at home, make sure you check out Custom Reptile Habitats for their premium enclosures. You can find an affiliate link in both the YouTube description or the show notes, or just head to animalsathome.ca slash CRH. If you use that link and head to their website to make a purchase, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you, and of course, that helps me support the show. Alternatively, you can join us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash animals at home for as little as 75 cents per episode you can support the podcast and you will automatically be entered into the discord server so you can have conversations with like-minded keepers if you do bump yourself up to the five dollar per month tier you will have early access to episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests so you had success with the blues you had success with the greens and and yeah. do you have is it is it do you have four species that you're working with the tree monitors now or how many six Oh, it's six. So it's a it's a blues, greens, yellows, blacks. The cordensis and the bomei. Okay. Those ones yeah. I'm not familiar with. Yeah, they're they're kind of the outliers, right? The common ones that everybody knows about that have been available for the last 20 years and imported shipments and stuff have been, you know, blues, yellows, greens, and blacks, right? And that was the big four that I initially tried to get and breed. And uh, you know, and then you know, I've successfully bred all those species. And then it was like, okay, well, there's still a couple outliers that I don't have, but they were, they never came into Canada. Like they have never come into Canada except for now, now that I know what I'm doing with import and export and I have good connections in Europe and Indonesia, you know, I've been able to get a couple animals, you know, from people. So I've been able to source these different pieces to finish the you know, the six monitor tree monitor puzzle, right? Or the six species tree monitor puzzle. So how, how different are they? Obviously the color is strikingly different. They're all very different that way, but their body shape and plan looks extremely similar. I mean, I've never, besides seeing the babies that you had at your table at the expo, I've not seen ad adults. So are there some size differences or behavior differences that you notice amongst the species? Uh, well, um, it's kind of a tough question because I don't, you will hear people say that McCrayi are bigger than Piscinus and that Bakari are, you know, bigger than, you know, Rising or I or whatever. In, in my experience, and now I've had a lot of animals and I've bred a lot and I have quite a vast collection, the overall body size is fairly comparable among all the species with the exception of the Cordensis. The Cordensis seem much smaller right so 
Like I have a female cordensis in my care now that bred and she, you know, when she was breeding and laying eggs, she started laying eggs at like 175 grams. And she was already five years old when I got her. Um, whereas something like a female McCrayi, you know, I won't usually breed those until they're about 300 grams. So that's the one exception. And then I do have out of, God, it's, it's it's even tough. Males are generally bigger than females, obviously. But like I have big males of every color tree monitor. Like I have a massive couple massive male McCrea, which are the blues. I have a massive male black. I have a massive male green. In fact, that male green probably rivals all of the other ones. So for me, I don't know if there's much difference between the overall size on average, because from what I've seen and all the animals that I've seen, you know, um, there's nothing to really, no real evidence of that, you know, unless I have small McCrayi relative to my, mm -hmm. you know, to my greens. So the only real noticeable one would be the, the Cordensis seem much smaller. And, uh, you know, it seems like every male McCrayi I have is pretty damn big. <laughs> so, uh, whereas the, I have a couple male black trees, the Bakari that are a bit smaller, but you know, I, I You'd have to you'd have to really analyze hundreds of animals to get a true a true estimate. You know, you hear people say, "Oh, McCray I are huge." Well, is it just the one that you had, or yeah, is yeah. it <laughs> how many have you seen? Right. So, you know, I have, geez, I have like seven seven or eight female McCray I in my possession right now. Ones that I are either wild caught or that I've raised up myself, and and uh, you know, that's just females, seven or eight females, and then I have you know another four or five males. I'm not breeding all those females. I just have a few in standby or whatever, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it seems pretty standard. And these are all different bloodlines too. Right. So it's not like it's just a, sh a small bloodline or a big bloodline. I mean, there's, there's some variety in the ones that I have, but I have heard of guy, like I know a guy in the U S that has a pair and his female McCrayi, she, the, that's a blue. She just laid like nine eggs. And on average I get five per clutch. Wow she laid nine eggs and he's telling me the weight of his femur. I'm like, Oh my God, those things are giant. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So who knows? And then diet plays a huge part in that, right? You can get a monitor lizard real big. If you feed it a real rich diet, doesn't mean it'll live long. I'm not saying that guy is, is like that, but um, you know, I've seen, I've seen people like I have yellow acts at Brady yellow for a long time. And my yellow ackies to me, they have a standard size. I feed them a variety of diet, mostly bugs and, whatever but i mean i remember selling uh, some of my own babies to a guy and he showed me his ackies like two years later and they were honest to god the size of these yellow oxy double of the size <laughs> of the adults right and i was like holy smokes like what the heck are you feeding these things because they're they're related right they're the same bloodline same genetics and he's like oh i just feed them super worms i don't want to mm -hmm. deal with and I was like, oh, that explains it. I mean, they were fat, but they were also really big and long. I was like, wow. But they never, ever bred for them. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's so many factors in the size. of it. But I'd say they're, you know, on a, I think they're all roughly the same size, you know. On and, and then behavior-wise, do you find that they're very similar? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> again they're super smart they're super individual so you get some that are like oh i'll run out on your shoulder and play with you and then you'll get some that i uh, slide the glass open and they run behind the bark right mm -hmm. and that goes for whether it's wild caught or captive bred i have some captive bred ones that don't like being around me and i have you know some wild caught ones that you know will jump on my shoulder so um on average i i think you know what bakari the black uh, black trees they start out really shy, but I think they're almost the most personable of the species that I have. Like they're always social. They always come out. They always eat from tongs. They always want to jump on your head. Like they're really cool. Greens, you know, I, I have a buddy who has a breeding pair of greens and his are super social, just like my black trees are. The greens that I have, you know, the ones that I have, I wouldn't say they're overly social. They'll eat from tongs and stuff like that. But, you know, the offspring from those ones, you know, one of them is is one that I sold uh, sold to die on there. And that's the Sabzi. And that thing, like, you know, it plays card games with them pretty much, yeah, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's all what you put into it and the individual personality. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I think you'd have probably have to do like an analysis of, you know, a bunch of captive bred specimens. So you start all with that same control and, you know, you have like 10 blues, 10 blacks, 10 greens, and then really treat them all the same way to see how their personalities come out. Right. Yeah. 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 It answered that, like a true scientifically minded yeah, person. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it's really hard to say. That's when people say these things. I'm just, I always, you know, I don't usually vocalize it, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, is that just the one that you have or whatever? Right. Yeah. 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 Are, are people, and I'm not advocating for this, I'm just wondering because they are, they must be fairly closely related as a species. Do people hybridize them at all? Yeah. Oh, I've, I've seen some hybrids made. I personally wouldn't. I don't yeah. see any value in it, right? Yeah, me um, either. I just imagine you could, I, could yeah. do, I see people doing these weird things all the time. And with a species like that, which are so close together, you can imagine that people are doing it. Yeah. I've seen a few hybrids that people have created, right? Usually it falls in like, you know, people have a female of one type and a male of the other, and they can't they can't find the opposing sex of either species. So they're like, oh, what do I do? And they hybridize, right? And the hybrids that I've seen, they they never look as good as either of the original species, right? Um, now they haven't hybridized all the different possibilities, but I think I've seen like a I think I've seen a blue tree and a cordensis cross, and I've seen a black and a green, and they weren't they weren't anything special. And then you really muddy the waters, right? So totally. Uh, yeah. But you know what? They're, they're, they're extremely similar. I mean, honestly, I, I, when, when did they evolve as different species? Like, I don't know. I want to say around the last ice age ending, right? So you're not talking a very long period of time. Um, you know, sea levels rose, isolated them on Indonesian little islands, and they evolved along different pathways for the last 20,000 years. And, you know, that in, in evolutionary, in the evolutionary scope of things, that's nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. They were and, all but, one species, of, they were all one species at the same time. And then whatever sure. evolutionary pressure was on their island that drove them to evolve the different colors, you know, that's, it, that's, that's where we're at now. But I mean, they're the same monitor, in my opinion, they're all the same monitor, just with different paint jobs. Yeah. And that's the yeah. fascinating part is how different, how different their color actually is when you have something as, you know, bright and vibrant as a yellow or a green to something as dark as, as the Bakari, the black, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, and the fact that they come from relatively close geologically, there's not a huge, you, you can't imagine there being a massive difference between uh, the evolutionary pressures, but obviously there must be. H have you spent time thinking about what some of those pressures might be to generate uh, the different colors? Yeah, like, I mean, you could only speculate, right? Like something like the blue tree monitors. You know, in terms of a land animal having a blue coloration, very, very rare, right? More common in birds than anything else, but reptiles blue coloration is a pretty rare thing obviously in any other any other you know uh kingdom of of animal they're they're it's really really rare except for fish right you see more blue fish than anything so what would drive a blue tree monitor to become blue i buddy i have no i have no <laughs> idea what that pressure was right uh, i have no idea so um yeah, I, I can't even speculate, to be honest. You know, yeah, like so fascinating. The, the the black tree monitors, you know, usually black reptiles, ones that are all black, they've evolved a black coloration because they need to absorb as much heat energy as possible from the sun, right? So either they're at high altitudes or they're from a cooler climate and all of those good things, right? So that was my thought on the black trees initially, right? I'm like, what? You know, what does Aru look like? What What's the elevation that you find black tree monitors at? You know, and I've asked some people that actually go out and collect and they're like, no, oh, no, it's the same as everything else. Like literally I'm trying to, <laughs> I've tried to find information on this, right? Where they're from, is their temperature different? You look at all the climate data, they're all the same, right? So the black trees, you know, I experimented with keeping them cooler um and i actually s seem to stir on breeding so there might be something to the black ones being black because they're from you know maybe a cooler cooler area maybe the the island of aru gets different ocean currents than the other side yeah. of indonesia uh, you know you never know I, I i to be honest i couldn't i couldn't even come up with an educated guess as to why you know you have a green and a yellow and a blue and you know who knows 
Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fascinating. Anyway, and and, and husbandry wise, is there things that you, you you know you've you've had them now for let's say you know twelve ish years? You've been working with them, breeding them very successfully. Are there things care wise that you've changed over the years, and some like maybe mistakes that you maybe have made or the adjustments you've you've made that think that's giving you the success and the health that you have in your in your clutch or your your collection? Um. Yeah, you know, some of the mistakes I made early on with the tree monitors was probably treating them like the Australian stuff. Like the Australian stuff, you really got to cook, mm-hmm. you know, um, and uh, they like it really hot. Tree monitors, they, they don't like it so hot. So you adjust the temperature a little bit on that front. But I think by the time I started with the blue trees, I, I was pretty dialed into like just monitor husbandry in general. And the reality is like, the the Kimberleys and and uh, Ackies and Pilbaras I keep in a particular way, um, and the tree monitors I keep pretty much the exact same way, just in a taller enclosure. Right, mm-hmm. subs it's all the same. Nest boxes, you know, I have more branches and cork tiles on the walls for the tree monitor enclosure and stuff like that. But you know, other than that, the general monitor blueprint of the cage is the same, or the enclosure it's the same. Right. So the lighting is all the same for all the species um, that I work with in terms of like the UV light and the spotlight. And it's just, yeah, it's like really there's there's nothing particular. I don't use any mist systems or anything like that. Um, so do you mist everything by hand or do you not mist? I do mist. I mist everything by hand. I'll spray everything. I'll give everything a little bit of a rainfall every second day. Um, if it's a, if it's a pair of tree monitors that's coming into cycling and, and you know, and I, I, I have it all mapped out. So I, they lay eggs every three months, roughly like a pair that's going well every three months. So I know that, you know, a female lays eggs on this day, two months after that day, she'll be starting to cycle again. Right. So, you know, when I know she's starting to cycle, then I'll spray them every day. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, to kind of stimulate the rain period, whether that does anything or not, I don't necessarily think it does for them, but it's just a, <laughs> what if, if it does, I'm, at least I'm doing it. Right. But, um, yeah, I missed them by hand. It's part of it is the interaction with the animals. Right. I find if everything's automated, then I, I miss out on key observations. Right. Yeah. So I, I like to go in there and spray um, because the animals like it. You, they come out, they drink from the hose, and you know you get to look over the animals. You get to see, make sure they're okay, and all that. And um, uh, yeah, so and then the same with the feeding, right? The feedings, I do all the feedings because they come out. I get a good look at them. You know, are they hunting properly? Or are they listless, lethargic? Like that's all part of it for me. So I don't, I don't really like the automated foggers and misters and all of that stuff. I just I mean, that's part of the joy of having them. I don't want somebody to do that for me, to be honest, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, uh, no, that, that's a good point. And those observations, like some of the things you notice when you're doing those, what seem like mundane tasks that you don't want to do, like that's where the learning, a lot of the learning comes in, right? Because you really get to know the animals when you do those things. And, um, so, you know, I, I like, I'm really hands-on with that. And the other thing is too, right? I can physically go in observe the enclosure and look at it and be like oh is it too wet in here is it too dry like how much do i need to mist it right if you have a mister that comes on three times a day it doesn't know it's just dumping water to the enclosure it could be exactly. super wet, whatever so and that's you know contrary to popular belief tree monitors do not like to be wet right they'll swim you know in a little pond if you give them that but i mean they, they get rain every day in Indonesia, you know, at a certain period of time in the day, but their environment does not stay wet. That rain dries out really quick, absorbs into the ground. And if you saw the terrain on Batanta, where blue trees are from, pretty damn dry, you know, from pictures and stuff. So, um, you know, rain, rainforest animals are not, you know, and I learned this a long time ago with things like emerald tree boas, right? It's like, People are doing, they think, oh, it's going to be soaking wet water, super hot, super humid. And that was everything wrong that people yeah, were yeah. And The I just, fogging, remember the fogging right? with Emerald Tree yeah, Bowl? It's yeah, just like, it looks like a nightclub and the thing's like, I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I, I don't do any of that. I err on the on the cautionary side of dry. Um, part of the problem is like, see, you know, you can have a very 
wet environment in a rainforest, right, that amphibians really like and stuff, like the Costa Rican jungle, let's say. But you have to remember, there's pretty good airflow there. If you're trying yeah. to replicate that in a, a wooden box, let's say, you're not going to get the airflow that will allow that to, you know, at least remain partially sterile, right? If you're exactly. air and you're wet all the time, you're going to have problems. You're going to have skin rot. You're going to have toes falling off. You're going to have all sorts of issues. So I like to keep them dry. And you can look at the monitor too and say, okay, does this thing need a misting, right? This, you know, you can look at it, physically observe. I'll spray you today. You know, you look a little bit dry or whatever. So, and that recipe seemed to work well for me um, and you offer water dishes as well oh yeah yeah that's that's a given right there's always a big water dish in there uh the water dish is actually big enough where they can kind of go and sit in it if they want to right in fact females that just have laid a clutch of eggs that's their mo they will come out of the nest box and they will go in there i have a, a hanging cup holder right i have deep deli cups for the water they'll like go in there and submerge and like cuddle up like a jacuzzi you know after a hard day of egg laying right that's what they do so that's one of the indicators where it's like oh she must have laid because the water bowl <laughs> spilled <the> oil, right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Do you, do you house everything individually pretty much? Is there any cohabbing for, for those uh, group of species? Um, I, I how, When I grow things up and I'm, I'm raising them, I raise every single animal individually. That way I, I know exactly who's eating, what, how they're doing, and there's no unforeseen stresses from cage mates and all that stuff, right? So... But then when they become sexually mature and, and there's something that I'm going to put into a breeding program, then I'll put them with a male and or like a females and males together, let's say. And then I'll leave them together. And the only time I will remove the males is when I know the female's about to lay eggs because in tree monitors, even in Kimberly Rock monitors, you know, monitors are egg eaters, right? So if you have a male in there that has a fresh clutch, he'll try and eat them. So I'll pull the males out and I'll put the males in separate enclosures and I'll let the female I'll give her peace and she, you know, she'll lay her eggs about a week or so after I pull that male out. And then I usually give her about a month after egg laying or so uh, to just be alone, recoup some body weight, energy reserves, and then I'll put the male back in there so that he's ready for the next cycle um, when she's ready to go again. Sometimes I'm forced to keep the males out because females, especially recently, I don't know what it is that I've changed, but... Uh, that, that has caused this, but I've had a lot of females that are really, really protective of their nests. Even after I go in there and I'll remove the eggs, you know, it could be a month after I'll go to put the male in and man, those females are just trying to chase those males around and like the males are scared. I mean, they run. <laughs> so, okay, I'll pull the male out. I'll give her another couple of weeks. I'll try again. Right. Usually about after a month, month and a half, they're good. But I have one pair this one yellow tree female, man, she does not like, she used to be great. I don't know what changed, but she just does not like that male in there. So I like with her, she's almost alone all the time. And I just look for her to start showing signs of cycling. She gets a bit hippie and, and bulky. And I'm like, okay, I better put the male in now. I'm like, you ready, buddy? Here you go. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm pretty good with timing that stuff on them. So within about a week, he gets the job done. And then he's like, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, everything else, all the Odatria, the pairs are just kept together. Um, you know, but I never raise them together. I think that's one of the critical things that people do wrong is they'll buy like three Ackies and they'll raise them all together, right? Because there's all this misinformation about them sexing themselves in groups and all this stuff, which is utter nonsense. And it ends up leading to nothing but problems. So, so I, uh, I, um, I raise everything individually for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Now, for the tree monitors, is there any common like health issues or illnesses or anything that you've had pop up over the years that you've you've kind of figured out how, how to deal with it, or have you had pretty much a stable, healthy population? Um, let me think. Some of the things that can occur are obesity in them, right? So, um, they're you know the general rule of thumb is feed them insects mostly, right? Crickets. Not too many worms, but you can feed them worms uh, of various sorts. People are, you know, now that you can get disco roaches, they love cockroaches and, uh, um, you know, a variety of bugs. People have feed them 
quail day old quail chicks and stuff and and you can feed them rodents like i feed mine rodents once a week like a fuzzy mouse or two for females um so but if you you know if you, females the mice because they're reproductively active and they're burning lots of energy right and they need to build up their fat so I tend not to feed males mice too much, right? The odd treat once a month or something like that. They'll get it because they love them. Um, so you have to watch out for obesity. But even then, I think if you have a reproductive female, it's pretty hard to get her fat, you know, if she's cycling and laying eggs. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I haven't seen it with mine because I'm, I, you know, I tend to know what I'm doing with the diet of them to, for the most part. So I can see, okay, you're getting a little too plump or you're too skinny and adjust the diet that way. But, um, but, uh, the tree monitors, they seem a bit sensitive to like skin things that happen. Um, you know, I've heard lots of accounts of like fungus, on skin or bacterial infections or things like that so uh but they're all like treatable things and i think a lot of times that has to actually do with the enclosures that people have being too wet right if you have a yeah. lot of moisture and warmth and stale air well you're going to get fungal infections and bacterial infections it's that simple so um i've seen it once and actually i've seen it once with uh with a yellow tree that uh, i i actually had imported and uh it came to me and it looked totally normal but i have a quarantine room i actually have the only lizards i have in my house separate from my reptile building are my quarantine area in the basement right so i have several enclosures set up in in the quarantine area and this thing i mean uh it looked totally it looked beautiful man when i got it, it was nicely colored and everything and then and, and, you know i didn't it was in the quarantine area clean sterile enclosure but it was carrying something right and it started to get this like uh scale rot on the back or i don't even know what it was i thought initially it was a fungal infection so i tried treating it as such didn't really do too much and then uh um i ended up i ended up treating it with like a betadine bath and then putting an antibiotic cream on it and it cleared up the infection and it went away but those are like some of the little nuances you know and i usually quarantine like wild caught like wild collected animals for like six months right mm -hmm. and this and, and good thing i do because this infection it was whatever it was was dormant for the first two to three months that i had this animal and then it just slowly started cropping up. I could see like a little bubble in the scales. I'm like, what's going on? You know, I didn't think much of it. And then, you know, one day you wake up and it's like, oh, it's a really big kind of blister. And I'm like, oh, geez, what is this? Right. So, you know, the the number one thing was to give it the the iodine or betadine bath because that stuff kills any parasite fungus, right? And yeah, that, yeah. you know, you know, if and that stuff's easy to come by, and then you then you can look at it and treat it with you know an antifungal or a or an antibiotic depending on what you need to do but um yeah they there are there are things like that monitors can lose toes and claws because they can't shed their skin properly if things are kept too wet right that's another common misconception is that people you know they think that their monitor lizard is having trouble shedding it's you know toe skin because you know because it's too dry and it's exactly the opposite right um this monitor skin needs to be a bit dry so that it can flake off right if it if it can't flake off then it forms constricted bands around their fingers and claws and as the lizard grows that doesn't grow with it because it's dead skin that hasn't sloughed off and it forms like a tourniquet and mm. their claws and stuff fall off so that's an um, interesting point. I mean, and the, they're so active with their hands, basically, right? That they're gonna that that dry skin's gonna flake off as they pass through bark and dig through things. So it kind of naturally will just rip apart and come off if it yeah, is dry enough. Yeah, that's one of the biggest misconceptions that people still have to this day. Is like they see their lizard shedding, and they spray. They want to spray the crap out of it, and like, oh, it's losing its claws and it's not shedding. Well, you're spraying it too much. You got to let it dry, right? Um, and you know, I've seen ackies that people have got from Europe, you know, on orders that have come in with layers and layers of shed on their tail. And it's just because they've been horribly wet and humid conditions. Right. So, uh, like I said, we can't mimic the airflow in our enclosures that the, that animals in the wild get. So you can't rain on them as much. It's that simple. Right. So, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. It, you see that with snakes too. People will, <laughs> when the animal starts to go into shed, they just start squirting it with water where usually the bad shed is often due to, to dehydration and not due to the fact that there's a humidity issue. You know, if the animal hasn't been drinking water, then you might have an issue with, you know, actually shedding the skin, but spraying it with, with water during the shed cycle itself is probably going to do nothing for it besides maybe bug it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Snakes are, yeah. Snake shedding. Like I used to have snakes and stuff and I would do the same thing, right? Oh, my snake is about to shed. I better make sure it has a human environment. And because snakes shed their skin in one continuous, uh, you know, one continuous uh, shed, I think it's probably beneficial that they have the humidity, right? It's like the dry snakes. That's where it starts cracking because there you need their skin to be pliable to come off in one big sheet. Whereas the lizards, there's flake off in patches, right? right. You don't yeah, want yeah. it to be one big sheet because they don't shed in the same way that a snake does, right? So, yeah, I just, that, and I think maybe that misconception does come from snake husbandry where you have to hose, hose them down, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. So they, they, need, they need some humidity, right? But they need to be able to get away from the humidity, like the, the monitors. And yeah, if, they're, if they can't get away from the wetness, then you're just going to have problems, right? So... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now what about the, the color? Like, obviously they have incredibly vibrant color and I know this is pretty common across many different species of, of reptiles that we keep is in captivity. You start seeing kind of a muted version of what you might see in the wild. Do you experience sort of a, a decrease in vibrancy or color with, with the tree monitors? And, and if you don't, is there something that you're doing that you think is kind of keeping it at more of a wild look? Um, it's hard to say because I think you know, to get a real grasp on that, you have to be like very multi-generational in your production, right? You have to have like, you know, you have to have the standard from what it was when it was wild caught to, you know, five, six, seven generations out. What does it look like, right? Right. Um, one, the color is individual on them, especially things like yellow tree monitors, right? I mean, you get a whole spectrum of imported animals coming in. Some of them look green. Some of them look ridiculously yellow right off the boat. That's with the total wide wild diet right so whether it's an age thing you know our young, younger monitors are generally more vibrant than older ones just to begin with so that could be it um monitor lizards they all go through this this uh stage in their life where their colors are just insane regardless especially with things like red ackies pilbaras Camberleys, and I'd imagine it's the same thing with the tree monitors uh, from what I've seen so there's that aspect of it um i in my collection i have like with yellow tree monitors i'll use those as an example because people always ask about oh that one you know yellows often seem green to me why are they called yellows right so um i've seen a lot of imported animals and i've done my best to pick the most yellow specimens fresh off the boat possible and i have some like incredible breeding pairs of yellows and uh they throw some incredible looking babies um the first yellows that i ever bred were imports as well and they were you know they were nice yellows and their their babies are 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 nice as well uh and i have this one particular baby from that pair that's like screaming yellow um so Part of it is just the variability within the species, I think. The other part is like having good UV lighting uh, and then diet, right? The, the diet that you feed them is going to work wonders on their color, right? Um, so like the feeder insects, the man, they get they get better food than I do. They're, they're <laughs> you know, they're so well fed, um, you know, so I try and cover the spectrum of nutrition through the bugs and, uh you know, every time I feed, before I feed those insects or something, like I'll, before work in the morning, I'll feed my feeders like a whole array of vegetables and fruits and different things. And then when I get home from work, they're all fat and gut loaded up, those crickets and worms. And then I start feeding them to all the monitors, right? So there's that end of it too. Um, so, and then you can feed them different foods that, will enhance certain colors, right? Like I, I talked to a guy that had a pair of Kimberly rock monitors and he's like, my Kimberly rock monitors love shrimp. 
And I'm like, oh, really? Shrimp. And he's like, you won't believe how red they are. And he showed me pictures of how red his Kimberly rock monitors were. I was like, holy smokes, they're like flamingos, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of what you feed them will translate into color, right? That's the premise of like the, uh, um, you know, a lot of the Rachdaclis diets, right? They have like color enhancing diets for like crested geckos and things like that. So, you know. It, that that's part of it a good diet will definitely enhance the color of your lizards sure yeah that, that that definitely makes sense um now i'm curious about this because obviously you're incredible what you're doing you're having success breeding these animals and, and there's an interest factor from your own self just in being interested in producing tree monitors but there's also the side that now you have to sell these animals and they are uh, there are more advanced species than, you know, than the leopard geckos and the bearded dragons. So when somebody does, you know, they come with a price tag as well. So hopefully that kind of weeds people out. But do you ever wonder, like, do you ever think about producing animals that do require such a high level of care or th- that require a-, a keeper to be in tune with what they're doing or, or, or turned on? Be- just because, you know, we, we see animals end up in the wrong hands all the time. I, I just wonder if you ever, if you ever s- spend time thinking about that. Oh yeah, a hundred percent, right? Like, uh, like you said, the price tag usually weeds out the impulse buyers, so that's good. Um, and generally, it's a process. When customers come to me, they're they're you know they're blank slates. They want to know the size enclosure. They're they have all sorts of ideas about what they want to do. They want to do really well by the lizards. So that's always good. Like every customer that I've ever sold to, it's not like they're throwing these things into a 10 gallon aquarium. Right. Yeah. Uh, they're like, okay, I built this, you know, this huge thing, there's plants everywhere. And so they already have the right mindset to do well with it. Like they, they know that, that it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult you know, somewhat difficult or, um, you know, it's going to require some care and maintenance, not just a throwaway pet here. So, so yeah, they, uh, you know, that usually I can tell by talking to somebody that they're on the right track. And most of the time, somebody looking for something like a blue tree monitor there, they, they know that what they're getting into, you know, just because they've already done a ton of background research. And I mean, there's a lot of I mean, if you read anything about blue tree monitors online, it already puts you on your heels thinking, oh, man, I don't even know if I want to do these because it sounds so difficult. But the reality is, is, uh, you know, there's a vulnerable stage after they hatch where, you know, if you don't do things right with babies and you have them housed together and you don't pick up on some subtle things that they can be difficult. But once they're past that, like to, you know, two month mark, I mean, they're they're honestly bulletproof. They're like an Aki, really. I mean, you just, you know have water available, feed them a varied diet, have the correct temperatures, and they'll do well in anything, honestly, mm-hmm. right? Like the babies, I just put them in a standard enclosure that I would use for any other monitor lizard that I that I breed, right? It's like a three foot long by 18 inch tall by two feet deep for individual babies. And the, the tree monitors will even use a rock stack, like the baby trees, right? So, you know, I don't overthink it. It's like, are the temperatures correct? Are they eating? Are they, do they have a place to hide? Do they have a place to get a little humid if they want to? As long as those things are met, they're really bulletproof. So I'm not really worried about that. If the customer has the, you know, if the person has the right mindset and they're like, okay, my temperature is this and this and this and this, and they show me a picture of their enclosure, I'm like, yeah, you're going to be fine with this thing, right? And I actually, like, I'm keeping them for a long time anyways. So they're, they're forgiving. I mean, if somebody makes a mistake, <laughs> they're, you know, their lizard isn't super vulnerable, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I guess, like you said, you the price tag definitely tells you the commitment level of that person that's wanting to buy. You, you're not going to have someone walk past your table at an expo and say, wow, that's a blue lizard. I'm going to go home with that today. And, and I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't sell them to that person anyway, but it, it does kind of shield it from that. Yeah, no, the when I bring a tree monitor to an expo, it's it's usually for display, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and nobody goes to an expo wanting to spend that kind of money, usually on a lizard. And was like, oh, okay, I don't have an enclosure or anything for it. I'll just drop this money on this and keep it in a shoebox <laughs> and build something, right? It's always a holy smokes, that thing is amazing. Do you have more available? When will you have the next ones? Uh, I'm like, well, you can put a deposit on one of these ones if you want. Go get all set up. I'll help you out, right? Most of these people that see me on the shows, I mean, I've received messages from them. There's been always like a slow trickle of interest until they finally 
okay, I want to do this now. Like, I think I'm ready, right? It's always like that. It's not like somebody walking through the expo and they see a leopard gecko for 40 bucks. But like, yeah, I can buy this 40 bucks. Who cares, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so, like you said, you, you don't have like deli cups of, of monitors uh, at, at the expo. Um, maybe as we wrap up here, you could just let us know. You've, you've, listed, you've listed some of the other monitor species you keep and breed as well, but you also have some geckos. And I, I forget if you've mentioned them. So maybe you could also mention some of the other actual outside of the monitor world that you keep and that, you know, if someone were to go to an expo in Canada, they would see that on your table. Yeah. So um, I breed the Lichianus as well. Uh, the racket or the uh, Monero gecko, Chahua, uh, gargoyle geckos. So I have the new Caledonian realm because they're they're kind of they're interesting, but they're really easy to keep. They don't take a lot of attention. So I have a few enclosures of those, and then uh, I do work a lot of, with a lot of the different Australian knobtail species. So you know the Levis Levis, the Levis pilbarensis albinos, the Stellatus, Wheeleri, 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 Sinctus, Amii. So I have the whole realm of uh, of Australian knobtails. I, you know, it, uh, for some reason they're not a huge seller in Canada. I think they're the coolest damn gecko you can get. But they just look <laughs> like these little Pokemons with these giant eyes and these giant heads and you know, all the little quirks about them. But you know, maybe they'll pick up in popularity. But I sell most of those things to uh, Europe and Asia. But but. Uh, but I love them, so I keep working with them. Yeah, and you never know; tides will change. They are a really neat species. And actually, last year I was really looking to get wanting to get into something, and that was on my list of like a potential option of uh, of something because you don't see them a lot, especially in Manitoba. You don't see them a lot, and uh, they are like you said. You look at them and you think, "Oh, that doesn't even look real." The way their hey. eyes are shaped, and yeah, they're interesting. I think that's part of the problem with some of these species is is like. You know, for the majority of Canada, they're not coming to the Toronto Reptile Expo to see them in person, right? But when people see them in person at my table, they're, you know, they're generally blown away like, oh my God, that thing is amazing, right? Yeah. And those are the people that actually see them in person. They're the ones that come back and like, okay, I really want that thing, right? They'll have taken a picture of it at the expo. Do you have any of these? And they'll send me the picture back. I'm like, yeah, I can, I got some of those. Yeah. So, but it's one of those things, right? It's like, unless you, when, when you see it in person, then it like it really blows you away, right? Because pictures don't often do them justice because you don't get a grasp of the size and and all of that stuff, right? Like yeah, you know, totally. Amy I like a nefarious Amy I mean that gecko is the size of you know a guinea pig almost. It's huge, right? Um, <laughs> not a guinea pig, but like you know it's a big, robust gecko. And when people see them in person, like wow, that's a wicked looking gecko, right? So yeah, well. You are someone who has an incredible amount of information in your head. And, you know, we already alluded to the fact that you're obviously a, a, a detailed note taker. And, and you did mention, and I, I know you mentioned it last time you were on, that your website is outdated and it's, you know, you're, you're working okay. on, <laughs> your goal is to eventually to, you know, to, to, to revamp it. And so maybe we could wrap up with just letting us know, you, you know, you don't have to put a timestamp on it. We won't hold you to it. But what what do you have in mind for your website as far as, you know, p- putting new information on there? And if people want to learn more about kind of the knowledge you have, is, is that something that they can eventually will be able to find there? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> it's funny, because as I was right, like, you know, my old website doesn't have any tree monitor stuff on it, you know, because that thing was built back in like 2009 or 10 or something. Um, and I haven't updated it. And honestly, I haven't had the need to. It's just been like now with social media and stuff, everybody kind of finds me. So I've been really lazy on that front, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, I, uh, I've i been in the process of writing you know, all of the descriptions for all the species of tree monitor that I'm working with and, and, uh, knob tails and, and all this stuff. Cause I had a lot of snakes when I built that one too. So that takes some time, but I will tell you though, I just, out of curiosity, I went to like, uh, I don't know if I can say this on a show, but like a chat, I use chat GPT and I said, Hey, I need a care and husbandry and breeding information sheet for Varanus McCrae. And you know, said, enter, what do you come up with, man? That thing wrote a pretty damn good care sheet, right? Like obviously <laughs> some tweaking, but I was like, oh, this is going to save me some time, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was really good. It was actually quite good. I was quite impressed. I thought it was This is what fun. you don't want your students to hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they all know, man. Everybody, yeah. knows. it's no secret, man. Everything exactly. Um, but yeah, so I, I would expect that within the next, within a year, I should have that up and running. 
Yeah, I think that would be pretty valuable, especially with someone like yourself who has done so many iterations. I mean, you must be in the top, you know, and tenth percentile of people who have had that many iterations of captive bred tree monitors. Uh, maybe, maybe the most. I don't know how many people are working with it across the world, but I would say worldwide, I've probably. I mean, at this point, I think I, I've probably produced the most captive bred ones <laughs> out there. I mean, there's some people in Europe that have produced captive bred ones of one particular species, maybe prior to when I did it. But like in terms of now of consistency and and numbers, you know, I I would say that I'm probably the most consistent in terms of having all, all the species now there's some people like my i have a buddy in in the us uh brian susan from sundown reptiles he's really consistent too he just got into some of these other species much later than i did so he's building up you know he's building up his collection um as well but like right now i have you know i have in the incubator clutches from every single species that i have with the exception of the varanus bomei right so all the tree monitors i have five different species in the incubator i'm actually waiting for that golden photo where i can hold all six species of tree monitors in my hands be the first person on the planet that can do that but i have to get these this last species to, to lay eggs for me and, and those eggs have to hatch well right? i i feel like the 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 other viral photo of of the four i guess it, I feel like that. I know that you do have those photos on your page as well, but that's got to be the one that people see going around with the blue, the green, the the yellow, and the black. That's got to be your photo, I assume. Yeah, that's mine. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you'll Although, be primed for another one. There's somebody that tried to replicate that photo, and they just took a bunch of wild caught animals and put them in their hands, and they were all the beat up adults, and they did that same <laughs> photo. But mine's the one with all these little babies in my hand, right? You know, those are the captive bred ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're just sitting there patiently waiting for the yeah. photo to take. And, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, but, well, so. Brandon, you are a, a wealth of information. I think it, it, I, I think it'd be awesome for you to have that website up to, to give more. And I know last time we chatted that you know, eventually maybe down the road as a retirement project, a book would be fascinating because as you said, there's, there's no one that has more iterations of these, these things. And I think to, to pull that information from someone like yourself would be so important. So maybe that's something down the road. Well, you know, I, I actually, um, this, this past year, I applied for a leave of absence from from teaching, right? Just an unpaid leave. I wanted some time to, to work on the reptiles, work on the website, work on a book. They denied me. They said, no, there's a teacher shortage. We can't let you go, right? Like, I swear, this is a true story. I'm like, what? Well, it's an unpaid leave. You really can't say no. And they're like, we can't <laughs> teach you. I'm like, oh, man, fair enough, right? But, but uh I was like, so I'm I'm trying. I'm trying. I just put in a, for a leave of absence for next year again, right? Uh, I just put the paperwork in yesterday, so uh, so maybe they'll grant it to me, and I'll have a bit more time on my hands because man, it's like my day is full. Like it yeah, is exactly. You you can't do all that while doing a full time yeah. job. So maybe this time they'll let you take a year off for free. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so, but you never know. You never well, know. In the meantime, this was this was fantastic. Thank you again for for joining me today. Can you let everybody know? You can let them know the website, but also the social media platforms. That's obviously where you're more active. So if anybody wants to uh, check out what you're up to, can you point them in the right direction? Yeah. So um, my website is uh, www.canadiancoldblood.com. Uh, my email that is a link to that website I use all the time. So. Even though the website's outdated, the email, Brandon at CanadianColdBlood.com. If you have questions or inquiries, whatever, you can email me. I have lots of people randomly just messaging me. Hey, can you sex this for me? Can you, you know, does this thing look in good condition? Do these eggs look good? And I'll always answer your questions. So I'm always willing to help whether you bought the lizard from me or not. Uh, Canadian Cold Blood on Instagram and Canadian Cold Blood on Facebook. Uh, just do a search. Although I will say this. It's funny because I've had a few videos that have gone fairly viral like had a few million views on like eggs hatching and stuff like that and ever since the fall i've i've gotten a, all these views i've had a few people copy like full-on copy my facebook page so mm. they my logo taken all my images and everything and they've even tried to like solicit customers under the guise that it's me so and most i i don't know of anybody that's actually been taken by there i think there's one definitely and i heard of another Canadian cold blood copy now where people are just trying to capitalize. I, I don't know how to get around that. I've tried 
you know, I've had everybody I know message Facebook saying this is a scammer page. Facebook doesn't do anything about it, yeah, right? Yeah. Clone, they don't care. So, um, you know, you can check out Facebook. You know, these new pages that were created, you can tell they're the fake ones because they only have like 50 followers or something. And then you could see my actual one. It's got, you know, whatever, 10,000 followers or whatever it is. So, you know, you be discriminant when you're looking at that and reaching out. And then um, again, if there's ever, if you were interested in buying something, shoot me a message. I'll give you my phone number. You can call me, talk to me on the phone. You, you can hear my voice. You'll know who you're talking to, right? So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, unfortunately, that is the problem with Facebook and Instagram is the, 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 the amount of scammers or whatever coming out of the woodwork now is just crazy, right? And I guess, you know, once you become more well known and trusted, people try and take advantage of that, right? So, um, but anyways, that's you can find me on those two platforms. Just be wary. I know there is a copy of my page on Facebook, and I tried, and I've had everybody else that I know try, and nothing seems to be ever get done about it. I know I'm yeah, not. Yeah. It's been copied, but just be careful on that. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's something we've talked about before. These pages getting ripped off, and then people getting ripped off, thinking they're buying something. And then, as far as expos, do you just do? Do you typically just do the one expo, or, or in? I mean, for those who are in Ontario or in the GTA area that attend expos in your area, do you do them more than once a year, or? I, I usually just do the CRBE. Okay. Um, in September, um, I did do the last one here in. Uh, was it the end of February or March in Toronto? I did that one. Um, but uh, usually it's just the CRB. Uh, so if anyone wants to say hi in person and they happen to be at the expo, they can drop by the table. Yeah, sometimes I'll just go to the expo and and like walk around and pick up a couple things or whatever, you know, say hi to people there. But um, I'd like to. It's just such a process. It's just such oh, a oh yeah, such a pro. And part of my part of my dilemma with that is I like going to the expo. I like seeing everybody. I like talking to people. And I like you know here's you know I like seeing people's reactions when they see the lizards. It's the setup is is uh, you know can be a lot. And, uh, and the other thing is too, is like, I, I don't necessarily need to go to the expo to sell these things either. So it's not like a necessity. I more so do it just as a day out to get out and, and do it. Right. So because of that, I'm not really drawn because of the, you know, the, the non, uh, necessity of doing it. I don't really do a lot of them, but, um, I like doing them, but yeah, CRB, I'm always there. Um, I'm going to try and do Tinley next year. Uh, if they, if they will give me a table, I'll try and do that in Chicago. Um, so, but yeah, that's typically the one, although I'm not against trying to get out West and do like maybe the Red Deer show or, you know, the Montreal show. Like if, if, uh, you know, Reptile Expo would, would get back into Montreal, I'd try and do that one, right. Just to, just to get my stuff out there to a new audience that might not have seen the stuff in person would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not against it. I, I wouldn't mind doing that, but yeah. And the other thing too, the Toronto Expos, they're quite regular, right? So like if you were to do every month, it's like, oh. Oh, it's like every set, every couple of weekends, you're packing yeah, up right. all these lizards. Like the same people with the same animals. It's like, it's nothing's fresh at that point. That's yeah, exactly. Problem, right? So at least when I go, I know that a lot of the people have never seen my stuff before. And at least when I go, it's different than the stuff that I had last year at crb mm. it's fresh whereas you know i know if i walk around at some of the monthly expos you know you see the same guys with the exact same animals yeah you know there's nothing nothing new there so yeah yeah better That's to part. keep it fresh right yeah yeah absence makes the heart grow fonder my friend it, that's exactly right well brandon thank you so much for for joining me if, if folks want to reach out to you they they know where to do it so so we'll have to do another one in the future again because this yeah. is fantastic so thank you very much yeah, no problem thank you for having me buddy all right that brings us to the end of that episode brandon thank you so much for joining me on the podcast you're a wealth of information and just fascinating to chat with listeners thank you so much for listening i'm sure you gained a ton from that episode if you have any questions or comments and you want to leave them on youtube please do that you can also do that on spotify as well for those of you that don't not know spotify does allow video so you can watch the video on the spotify version but you can also comment fortunately i can't comment back but i do appreciate seeing your comments there's a few of you that comment regularly and that is awesome to see 
If you enjoyed this episode and you want to help spread the word, just sharing it on social media does a huge amount of work. Just finding more people to listen to the podcast is, is a is a very important way that you can help the podcast grow. If you are interested in supporting the podcast otherwise, you can head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can learn about our Patreon at patreon.com slash animalsathome, or you can learn about the show's sponsors. That's all in the show notes for each episode. And I think that is it for today. Thank you guys so much for listening and I will catch you in the next episode.